How's everyone doing today? Welcome back to On The Ball and welcome back to another episode of Review The Prem where me and my brother go head to head in predicting Premier League outcomes. Let's see how we did get on this weekend. A massive, massive weekend in terms of the Premier League and the way the scoring works. As you can see on the top hand side of the screen, it's 371 to Sim, 358 to me. It's five points for a completely correct scoreline, one point for a correct result and the star man is five points for a goal, two points for an assist. Let's see how we got on first up is St. James's Park, Newcastle against Tottenham. I'm, I'm happy that we can get this one out of the way as soon as possible. But Sim did predict the team to score four, but it wasn't Tottenham. It was, uh, well, it wasn't Newcastle. It was Tottenham that he did predict. The Newcastle won 4-0, obviously, an absolute demolition job of Tottenham at St. James's Park. I went for 2-2. Two -two. Uh, like I said, Sim went for 4-2, but... It was just a terrible game of football from Spurs' perspective, but unbelievable performance from Newcastle. And yeah, and they really did a job on Spurs. They adjusted their system. They were sitting a lot deeper, making sure that um, they didn't give Spurs the space Spurs like to play. And they knew that with Barnes, Gordon and Isaac in their front line, as soon as they hit Spurs in that trans in that transition, they could uh, be devastated in exactly what they were. Spurs can live with Isaac, but it wasn't helped by some really bad individual defensive errors from Tottenham, which gave Newcastle the ascendancy. But even without those individual errors, the, the team most likely to score was definitely going to be Newcastle on the day. And they ruthlessly exploited Tottenham tactically. And you've got to give massive credit to Eddie Howe and Newcastle because they were very depleted. Yet they came up with a way of overcoming that and really uh, taking Tottenham to the sword. And it was a dominant victory in the end. Um, really bad result for Spurs, obviously, in the top four race. Leaves them lagging behind a bit. Um, I, I wonder if Newcastle, do you reckon there's any sort of outside thinking with them thinking like you know they're in decent form at the moment Tottenham has still got Newcastle I still I still got Liverpool City and Arsenal to play like do you reckon there's any thought like if we can win all our games maybe there is a, a, still a top five place for us yeah I'm not sure if they'll be thinking that but I think that is a possibility um you know Time is running out, though. What, seven games left of the season, mm. six games left uh, for some teams as well. So, look, I think there is a possibility, but I think they've probably left it a little bit too late. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I, I'd like to think as a Tottenham fan, we're not going to just lose every game. But with the, we've seen with it happen what, before. Yeah, and with what we've shown, or we definitely saw it last season, how we ended last season. And obviously, recent form, especially away from home, has been very, very bad. But I'm hoping we can turn it around against the big, bigger sides, uh, um, you know, uh, at home. But, but, you know, regardless of that, obviously, we'll get into the Aston Villa result later. That result for Tottenham does make it very difficult for Tottenham to finish in the top four now. And in terms of Newcastle, this uh, top this race for sixth and uh, Europa League is really hotting up, isn't it? Yeah, Newcastle fancy their chances because they got some good players there and they finished top four last season. And if they can play like they did on the weekend, maybe they still got some fight left in them. Yeah, uh, we'll see what happens with that one. But let's move on to Brentford against Sheffield United. Sheffield United all but down and they did lose by two goals to nil. Simeon was 100% spot on, 2-0, a goal in the 93rd minute of the game, saving Sim and getting him a five-pointer. I went for 2-2. Two -two. I expected, um, you know, Sheffield United to throw, show a bit more fight in this one, uh, but alas, it wasn't to be. I mean, I think Brentford nearly went 2-0 up with about half an hour to go. The goal was disallowed, but um, yeah, convincing victory for Brentford. Yeah, and it's a victory they needed to really um, ally their fears of going down. I think that now puts them seven points clear of the drop zone. They, you felt like one win and they'll probably be all right um, from now to the end of the season. And it was obviously Sheffield United at home, which is where it came. And it was a, it was a routine victory. Brentford, um, the whole day, uh, looked like most likely to score and most likely to win. And that's exactly what happened. The only, I guess, big talking, talking point is the second game in a row that Tony didn't start. Um, I wonder what's going on there. But he was on the bench. Yeah, the, uh, he said before the game that he's injured and um, he'll only be called upon in an emergency or like those he, sort of But lines. he came on last game and then he's yeah. on the bench again. Do you reckon there's something more to that? Are they getting ready for life without Tony potentially? I mean, I wouldn't blame them if they were because the season's all but done for Brentford. Um, and Tony has made it very clear that he wants to leave in the summer. Uh, they've got players that are capable of filling in that role, as you can see with Wissa and Buemo's back now. Um, 
more pies stepping in and scoring goals, you know. So they've got players that can do the job. So I don't mm. see why not. I remember, I just remember very clearly, I remember Spurs had a situation when Walker was looking to leave. At the end, even though he was our number one right back through the season, I remember like the back end of the season, the last like five games or so, he wasn't injured, but he was on the bench and Trippy was picked ahead of him, even though he'd been a number one right back. And then after the season, it became very clear it was because, you know, he'd wanted to leave. So I do wonder if that's something similar happened with Tony here. And you are seeing a bit of a similar situation at PSG with him. Mbappe as well. Um, I know Mbappe is still scoring loads of goals and still playing loads of minutes, but there are cases in certain games where he's not starting. There are cases in certain games where he's being taken off early as well. And Enrique has said, like, we're trying to plan for life without him. Mm, so I do wonder if that's happening. So, uh, but yeah, great win for Brentford. Obviously, Sheffield United, if they weren't already down, they definitely are now. Obviously, 10 points away from Forest with six games to go. There's no catch in that. But yeah, Brentford securing another, probably securing another season in the league. Maybe they'll feel like a few more draws will do it but they should be all right I think looking at the table yeah, and I'm looking at them and in terms of their performance level throughout the season I do think they're too good to go down anyway mm. and yeah, I, I compared expect to those other teams down there yeah and I expect maybe if they're using Tony money wisely maybe a bit of an improvement next season yeah, it depends how much they're going to get for him I mean mm. the original figure people were talking about was like over 100 million 80 to 100 million I saw a report the other day saying 30 to 40 like surely he doesn't go for that low no, I'll be, although he is one year left, I think, isn't he? So maybe they'll have no choice. But I'll be shocked if it's only 40 million. Yeah. Uh, would you take him at Spurs? Yeah, I think he's a great player. I think we can really do with someone like him at Spurs. Yeah. Because not, it's not just his goal scoring. I think his overall game is so underrated. I think he's a, he's a, he's a great hold-up play. He's really good at bringing other players in. Uh, into play as well. I think it would be a quite a good um, um, a, um, alternative to like a son. I agree with you, but I mean, I do worry about his attitude. Um, he do his attitude stinks, and for the amount of um, you know what Brentford have given him in his career, and yes, he's given them um, equally you know uh, success and great great years and great footballing ability. But the things he does um, in his personal life, in terms of you know going to the camera and saying "f Brentford" and going in interviews and and clearly stating his objectives and what he wants to do, and a, basically a "come and get me" plea to like the big clubs, it mm. just doesn't sit right with me. That's fair enough. And that is definitely something to take into account. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to Burnley Brighton. It did finish 1 1. Sim went for 2 0, 2 1 to Brighton. I went for 1 1. So I got a big fat five pointer in this one. And I did say in the uh, build up that these are the games that Br Brighton like to drop points in, particularly away from home. And Burnley, uh, they're not losing too many games, but they're not winning too many games at the moment. And they need to start winning games if they've got any hope of survival. Uh, for sure, um, albeit that, you know, with the point deduction, still six points. So it's not quite over for them yet, but it's looking really unlikely at this point with five games left, so only 15 points to fight for. I kind of feel for Burnley because took the lead quite late on. And you're thinking if they can get a hard full victory here, they're three points off the survival and they're really giving themselves a fighting chance. Albeit there was a quite a big slice of luck with the goal they did get from Brownhill. I think he rode two challenges and then ran straight into a defender whose clearance smacked into him. <laughs> and then about slices of luck and then yeah I was you about to get into it I mean luck. I don't think it's luck I think it was absolutely I mean it's the second week in a row isn't yeah. it for the Burnley keeper um, the, the they play a uh, pass straight back to him and he lets the ball roll, roll under his foot and company must be ready to absolutely deck him after that because after what he did last week in that six pointer against uh, Everton kicking the ball straight, straight at Calvert-Lewin to do that again when you're looking like you could be this getting three worse. points oh he must be absolutely livid with him it's like it's like one of those things surely now like you, you can't go get back especially if Burnley go down like you can't get back from that it's a bit like Carrius in the Champions League final like whatever you want to say about him even though he had like a good year that year there's no going go coming back from that yeah the thing though is like he's come into the team because of the poor form of Trafford I know uh, but Trafford was never as bad yeah. as these kind of uh, moments that you've seen in the last two games Murek as well was like a key part of Burnley coming up in the Premier to the Premier League last season um, from, from with great displays in the Championship for Burnley I think he played every single game in um, in the league for Burnley last season but these two mistakes are unforgivable and they, they literally could cost Burnley their uh, top flight survival. Cost them potentially four points here and those four points put them right in the thick of it uh, for survival. So um, company must be gutted because 
they've stuck with him haven't they and you know a lot of the time people are saying they should sack him and their form recently in terms of performance was massively improved but unfortunately because he's really bad mistakes they're not getting the points that their form deserves and at this stage of the season if you're not getting the points it's going to cost you and you're and that's what's going to relegate them and uh they've look in the last five games they've only lost one so that's a massive improvement but only one win there as well yeah. so you got to, you got to feel for company because he's really up their games but when your keeper's doing that what are you supposed to do yeah it is only one win because of what the keeper's doing mm -hmm. and um it is massively unfortunate but in terms of vincent company if i'm the hierarchy of burnley i keep him in the job i think he's done a really good job i know they're at the bottom of the second bottom of the table and it looks like they will be going down but look at the squad that they do have like they have the second worst squad in the league probably or you know comparable with luton and sheffield united so what what do they expect 100 percent. i think he'll tell you he's going to take them straight back up if he uh if he if like, they get relegated any other manager would have kept burnley in the in the league this season I, I don't know the only question is if a premier league club does come calling will he stay yeah that's, that's the only that's other big question for burnley um next up is manchester city against luton it finished 5-1 to man city sim went for 4-0 i went for 5-1 so another five pointer for me this weekend and yeah as you would have guessed it was an absolute demolition job for man city i'm not quite sure how uh, luton scored to be fair because <laughs> I think for 75% of the game, Luton didn't even get into the half of uh, Man City's half. I mean, the, the whole of the first half was pretty much played in Luton's penalty area, wasn't it? And they just yeah. couldn't break them down. They got an own goal in the second minute. And you're thinking, all right, they are going to absolutely pulverize them in this half. And they just couldn't find the goal. Yeah, it was a weird one. It's like as soon as... Um... It was like as soon as Luton scored, it pissed them off a bit. It was like, well, what do you think you're doing scoring against us? And then all of a sudden they went and scored a bit of a, a few late goals um, after that. Um, but it was a demolition job for Man City. Nothing really that you uh, would have um, was unexpected on the day. Um, they, again, had the luxury of resting players like Foden, who's been scoring goals left, right and centre. And even De Bruyne, who's my star man, didn't even get have to get involved in the act, even though he started in this one. Um, it was a very, very easy day. Uh, you get minus for, points for a booking, no? Uh, no chance. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no chance. But um, a really easy day for for Man City. Um, Luton uh, no, took another battering, unfortunately, for them. Again, they can't really seem to keep that back door shut, which has been a big, big problem for them. Um, they'll take heart. They never really gave up and obviously did score a goal late on. But when you come up against Man City, it was always going to go in one direction. And wow, what a great result for City. And we'll get into what it means for the title race later, I guess. Yeah, Gavardio, goal and assist. What a goal from Jeremy Doku as well. And also, that's two goals, two goals in two games for Gavardio with his right foot outside the box yeah unbelievable incredible unbelievable um erling harland only being able to score from the penalty spot there's something a bit off with erling harland um since he's come back from his injury isn't it he's just not hitting those heights yeah he's coming for a lot of criticism uh roy king called him a league two player um he's still top goal scorer at the moment in the league but you're right he doesn't seem as sharp as self he's not getting the same level of chances that he that he has been and it seems as though he's only scoring as well against like the bottom teams when he faces good opposition he can't seem to have the same impact so um and also their best performance for, uh, from a four player you know it was probably when they beat villa 4-1 and foden scored a hat-trick and harlan didn't even play that game yeah so maybe there's a case for harlan not being in the team at the moment yeah and on Luton, I mean, how many own goals are they going to score? <laughs> own goal against Spurs, own goal against Arsenal, another own goal here against Man City. It's yeah. just not going their way, is it? They can't seem to not put it in the back of their own net. Um, but obviously, they're not going to be judged on these games. Luckily for them... Um, Results kind of went their way with the other team, so still gives themselves a fighting chance here. Big, big games to come. All right, we move on to Nottingham Forest against Wolves. It finished 2-2 at the City Ground. Both of us went for 2-1 to Nottingham Forest. And uh, this was a bit of the uh, the Cunha show uh, for Wolves. I thought he was brilliant. Some really good goals in there as well. But someone that is stepping up for Nottingham Forest week in, week out at the moment, maybe apart from the game against Tottenham, is Morgan Gibbs-White. Um, seems to be really uh doing his job in terms of trying to get them safe and sound yeah i think um wolves will be delighted to have Cunha back because that opening goal they don't score that goal if he's not on the pitch in terms of they don't have that kind of quality in their team he he, he beat two players then did like a pirouette cut inside and smashed it into the top corner that kind of quality is what has got wolves so far up the table because they need that kind of individual quality with the way they play and it was an astonishing opening goal from Cunha. but for credit to um, nottingham forest they you know didn't let 
let their heads drop. They turned it around. Goals from Danilo and, as you said, Morgan Gims white um, getting them in the lead. But they'll be very disappointed because having taken the lead, you know, and fought their way uh, into a position where they could really start looking at safety. Um, to concede again um, to Cunha, uh, I think it was from a corner, I think the second one, will be very, very disappointing uh, for Nuno because uh, when you're in the lead against Wolves side, you shouldn't really be giving that up because they're not the most attacking team Wolves. They like it when they're in the lead so they can counter-attack you. But if you're in the lead against them and you're sitting back, you should be really making things very difficult and they weren't able to do that. So only come away with the draw. Um, at least it's a, a point better than any of their other relegation rivals but still keeps them right in the thick of things so yeah. the pressure is not going to turn away until they're um getting away from the relegation zone yeah one point above luton as it stands going into the final stretch of the season so it's all to play for down there at the bottom mm -hmm. bournemouth against manchester united up next it finished 2-2 sim went for 2-1 as did i and um look it was another lackluster performance from manchester united two goals from bruno fernandez one from the penalty spot getting them out of jail it was 2-1 at half time to bournemouth and i was just thinking at half time bournemouth going to kick on in this second half and get more goals but just didn't seem to work out that way well that, i thought they were by far the best team better they team were. uh throughout the whole game i thought man united scored two goals against on a play um really brilliant stuff from solanke who absolutely bullied that uh, united center back for that first Kambuala. goal Kambuala. he was coming in for a lot of credit but it showed his inexperience there with that moment. Uh, I felt bad for him because he just got absolutely bodied for Solanke's, for, for, by Solanke for that goal, but really great play from Solanke to score. They did score a goal against runner play with Bruno, but then deservedly got back in the lead through Cliver, who seems to be in quite good form at the moment. Maybe Cliver's starting to come into his own a bit because he's um, last few weeks, he's starting to get some regular goals and assists. And he was a player who promised a lot in his early days at Ajax. Then he's kind of been a roamer. He's been a, around a few clubs, hasn't quite done it. Um, but now maybe he's finding a home at Bournemouth because recently he's starting to really do something. So is he starting to fulfill his potential? Uh, maybe. He was a player that Mourinho said when he was Ajax, he wanted a Man United. Mm. Do you remember on the pitch uh, after the game, he went up in to the him, Champions, he? In the yeah. Europa League final. Yeah. Yeah, he said, I want to bring you to Man United. So... Um, I would love it if he, he starts filling his potential because he seemed like a real prospect early in his career. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as you say, they couldn't hold on to it. But I'll have to say, it's not a penalty, that uh, the penalty for Man United in the, in the second half, in my opinion. Um, I think... Uh, the referee shouldn't have given it. I don't think Adam Smith intended to handball. It was a, def uh, a shot deflected onto uh, off someone else onto his arm. There's a good question whether he's high enough on his arm not to be a penalty anyway. Um, I don't think he moves his arm towards the boys. I think he's trying to pull it away and it just smacks his arm out of nowhere. I think it's ball to hand. I think it's unintentional. And I think uh, Man United got a very lucky decision there uh, to get the penalty. Obviously made it 2-2. They got a bit of luck right at the end as well when the ref gave a penalty be in the 90th minute, be overturned it. Obviously Obviously, it probably was just outside the box, but uh, Iraola made the case that he thought it was on the line. Um, so it was quite, it was a very tight decision, and I feel bad for him because VAR got involved and decided to overturn it. Um, but it was a very tight call. But I thought Bournemouth, uh, if only one team were going to win, it was going to be them. And again, another really poor performance for Man United. Seems to be the same thing every every single week with them. Yeah, and I said last week, didn't I? I said Manchester United are the luckiest team in the Premier League uh, this week. Well, has any have they done anything this week to change our minds? No. no, they're still the luckiest team in the Premier League, getting away with a point at the Vitality this weekend. Uh, but let's move on to the Sunday games. Liverpool against Crystal Palace finished one nil to Crystal Palace at Anfield. Sim went for two one. I went for three one. And it probably should have been 2-1 or 3-1, the amount of chances that Liverpool had in this game. I mean, I couldn't believe what I was watching at times, particularly in that second half. I mean, it was all Liverpool. The chances that were being missed by the likes of Mohamed Salah and Darwin Nunes and these kind of players. I mean, like, how did Liverpool not win this game? It was unbelievable. You got to give credit to Crystal Palace and the way they defended, the way, um, you know, they were keeping their structure and stuff like that. And a good goal for Eberich Yeze. But Liverpool got to be kicking themselves. Yeah, to be fair to Palace, now first off, they probably could have been 2-0 two, two up with some of the chances they had. Uh, as you say, as they put them up, 1-0 up really early on. What, what, what you have to say is a really great team goal. I think it was a 26-pass yeah, uh, move from Crystal Palace. And if that was another team, you know, they'll be getting a lot more credit for that kind of football they played. And maybe Glasner, 100%. you know, I think this is his first win since his opening game as Palace manager. Maybe he start, he's starting to really implement his ideas. And that was a really good evidence of that. They could have gone 2-0 up when Mateta goes through on goal and um, lobs the keeper, but it was a brilliant um, 
goal saving challenge by uh, Andy Robinson on the line. So I think Liverpool, what really cost them was that first half, to be honest, because second half they completely dominated Palace. There was chance after chance after chance, and then some as well. Um, shots off the line, crossbar, um, just bad misses, missing the title. I think. Curtis Jones had a one on one, just misses the target. Jota had one as Jota, well. Jota, Salah. It was, I think you could probably go for the whole team. They all had one. Um, and so they'll be absolutely kicking themselves considering the results, um, the other results this weekend as well. And the, having the amount of chance they have. And also, when you couple into the fact, Man United last week, how many chances they had that game and didn't win? Thursday night, Atlanta at home, how many chances they had that game and didn't score? And now again, so I don't know what's been happening the last few weeks. I don't know if someone's put a curse on them that no one could have a better finish than Prime Emil, Emil Heskey, or I don't know if where they're tensing up because they're getting close to the finish line and it's Klopp's last year and all of a sudden they're thinking, oh my God, this you know it's now or never and they're tensing up a bit. Um, I don't know what's going on with their finishing ability, but it's completely deserted them in the last three games. And it feels like things are starting to fall apart with them, but I don't think they're paying badly, which is weird because they're still dominating teams, creating loads of chances. But for the last three games, their just finishing has been atrocious. And I don't know what is, what's happening with them. It's kind of coincided with the return of Mo Salah as well, hasn't it? Which is mm. a strange one because Mo Salah has obviously been one of the best finish in the, in the Premier League um, of recent times. And he's come back. I think he has scored a couple of goals, but like you say, all those three games and Big games as well, you know. This game was massive uh, this weekend to keep up with uh, Man City. And obviously, we know what happened with Arsenal, which we'll get on to in a bit. The Europa League one, losing 3-0 at home in the mm. Europa League, um, leaves them with a big task to go to Italy and, and win by three goals or more uh, to keep themselves in the tie. Um, so, yeah, if you're a Liverpool fan, you've got to be worried because a few weeks ago, people were talking about the quadruple just before that game at Old Trafford in the FA Cup. And now um, they could be going out with a whimper with only leaving themselves with the Carabao Cup. The only solace I'll have for the fan is at least when, when you watch them, it's not like they look like they're running out of ideas. They are still consistently just creating chance after chance. Now the finishing for some reason or other is gone completely against them. But you get, but you, if you're a Liverpool fan, you'd think if you keep playing like that and creating more chances like that, it will start to turn again. But I do feel like stuff like this has been happening with Liverpool all season. To be fair, like how many times have you seen Liverpool pump a team and then only it goes to the last minute for them to to get the winner? I mean. I look at Liverpool and I look at Arsenal and I look at Man City and I do feel like Liverpool have been the most unconvincing out of the three. Um, maybe. Uh, I think when they've been good, well, maybe lately they have been. I think in general, uh, especially, you know, when they've been well on top of teams and creating loads of chances, I think they've looked very good. Maybe, I, I think defensively, I would agree with you. They're definitely the most unconvincing defensively. And from that point of view, if you're finishing off, you've all, uh, unlike, you know, um, Arsenal or City, where they're a bit more solid at the back, they're more likely to keep a clean sheet. When Liverpool are having an off day in front of goal, they're likely to drop points or, or, or lose the game. So uh, maybe from that point of view, I, I agree. But I think they probably create the most chances out of all those three as well. So, um, it's a difficult one from them. Um, I feel like they'll they'll feel like it's <laughs> that everything's falling apart. But if they just got to keep believing, because um, if they can play, if they they could have won that game four one, you know what I mean? Mm. They, you you could be watching that same game; it would have been four one. It would be in the same game. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if um, they still. Uh, uh, have a good end to the season but it's about how that these kind of performances affect them mentally because if they let them get to them and then they, all of a sudden they start dropping in confidence then all of a sudden that things can start to turn for them all right we'll talk about the ins and outs of the title race uh once we get onto the arsenal game but let's go to west ham fulham up next it finished 2-0 to fulham at the london stadium both of us went for west ham wins 2-1 and what happened to west ham in this one i mean fulham absolutely um tore them to shreds at times 3.29 xg for fulham at the london stadium when they only had a 0 0.93 and um andreas pereira hmm. with two goals on the day i mean andreas pereira since moving from manchester united to fulham i mean he has really shown himself to be a really good premier league player and getting goal contributions quite regularity yeah Thank he's you. he's quite he's um 
he's a good set piece taker. He gets he's good. At, he's got a good delivery. He's got a good um, ability from long range as well. But he showed a different side to him in this one. A bit more getting into the box. A good poacher's effort. Good late runs as well, which uh, won't be same up for the second goal. Good at hat trick in this game as well. If he didn't miss um, some of the chances he missed as well, so it was a bit of the Pereira show. Phenomenal from them, and I think maybe they benefited from having that free week for them because uh, West Ham looked leggy. They looked tired. Um, they looked like they had a grueling. And look, let's be honest, Thursday, they spent the whole of Thursday chasing shadows, didn't they? Um, against Leverkusen, one of the best teams in Europe at the moment. And I think that really showed in this one where they looked like they couldn't get near Fulham. Yeah. Um, obviously, Jared Bowen was missing, well. He's missing as well. He's a big miss for them. They started Danny Ings in this one. Didn't have the same impact. And it just felt like as soon as Fulham took the lead, West Ham didn't really have an answer. So really lackluster display from West Ham. And um, look, they got a massive, massive game on Thursday. But if they go out, which they probably will, to Leverkusen, um, you know, their European chances, they're still right in there. There, but they got to perform a lot better than that if they're going to get into the top six. Yeah, you look at it, they're two points behind Newcastle, uh, but everyone around them have played Leicester games with them. Chelsea mm. behind them by one point. They've got two games in hand on them. They've got Man United and Newcastle both on 50 points above them who have played a game less than them as well. So it is going to be a tall order, I think, for West Ham to get into those European spaces. But... Um, you know, Man U not really playing well. Chelsea, you don't really know what you're going to get. Um, and Newcastle as well, uh, you know, a bit up and down. So it's all to play for still. Yeah, for sure. But performances like that, very unconvincing for West Ham. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's I'll go to the Emirates and Arsenal nil, Aston Villa 2. Both us going for Arsenal win. Sim went for 2 1. I went for 3 0. And this was a great game to watch. <laughs> I mean, I thought Arsenal uh, started the game the better of the two sides, looking really good, missing a few chances here and there. And then I felt like the game twisted and turned when Ollie Watkins, there was a bit of a muddle up at the back from Gabriel hitting the ball into the back of Zinchenko. Watkins goes through on goal, hits the post, hits the inside of the post and it then curls round and goes uh, to the other side. And I was thinking it was going to go in, into the net and then it just kind of like goes past the post and uh, it goes wide. I think the game kind of changed from there, didn't it? Well, 30 seconds after the, after that moment, Trossard has an unbelievable chance and uh, Martinez saved. But I think that plays into your point because I think those two moments, first of all, Villa showing they can be a threat and then Arsenal missing a massive chance. All of a sudden, after that bit, that little bit of uh, play, the mentality changed a bit and I think Arsenal seemed to tense up. I do wonder, in a weird way, you would have thought, looking at the Liverpool result, that would have encouraged them. But it all, all it almost kind of like scared them a bit. It was almost like they looked at the Liverpool result and it felt and it was like they had the mentality like, well, if this happens to us, oh God, they just happened to Liverpool. Maybe that could happen to us as well. And they did start the game in a decent way, but as soon as they missed a few chances and they didn't take an early lead and then Watkins had that moment, as you say, all of a sudden, like the it started to filter through. Maybe um, visions of last season started to come back into them. Whereas like, you know, we did bottle it last season and, and all of a sudden they weren't playing the same way and I think it definitely came into a, 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 to a head in the second half because I thought the whole second half was yeah. pretty much all Villa yeah. it was really odd you would have you know v Villa had a game Thursday night as well you'd have thought Arsenal had a couple of days extra preparation they would have been fresher and lasted longer in this game but Villa were the ones who ended much stronger especially in the second half they were keeping the ball a lot better yeah. they were dominating the ball they were the ones making the run obviously Tielemans hit the bar in the post what an effort uh, late, uh, just before he scored that was an unbelievable effort Zaniolo was causing them all sorts of trouble down the left hand side and then um, I thought they got what they deserved in this in the second in right at the end there with um, Bailey coming on and obviously scoring that goal and and, um what can sitting them um on the break does um does there need to be a bit of a conversation also in the last couple of games about Gabriel? Because I was about to say he is something's going on with him. Our Bayern, he gives the ball away for that first goal awfully under no pressure. This one, he seemed all over the place uh, in this game as well. It's, I don't know. He seems to be cracking a bit, Gabriel, for some 100, reason. Hundred, hundred, hundred percent. I was about to uh, bring that point up as well. Like these two games, two crunch games where they mean so much, and he's been brilliant all season. He really has been brilliant all season. One of the defenders of the season. But in the crunch time, when it really matters, in April, Arsenal's favourite month of the year, um, he is cracking under the pressure. There's no two ways about it. And uh, these moments that you've seen against Bayern and against uh, Aston Villa, you haven't seen a shadow of that throughout the whole season from Gabriel Slow. I think he's bound down to the pressure. Um, there's also a bit of a conversation about Arteta because... 
you know, they've played Havertz in the number nine recently, and I think they've been in great form. One like, what, ten, nine, nine of the last ten games. They've been playing Jorginho in the midfield and Kiwior left back. And he changed up for this one. You could argue, look, he needs to change up like a bit like Man City. They need to change up to keep things fresh. But they just didn't seem the same vibrancy as they have been recently. Have uh, Jesus, I thought, had a bit of a shocker. I don't think he was really doing much in this game. Havertz didn't look as comfortable in midfield than he did uh, maybe in the number nine. They maybe missed Jorginho a bit. Zinchenko, I thought, was getting exposed on that right hand, that left hand. So he's been terrible. terrible. And I thought he was awful for the goal as well. So was he guilty of tinkering too much or is it hard to, to, to kind of judge it with, you know, that he brings in the likes of hate. He brings in some good players there. So can I, you blame Arteta too much? Nah, I don't think so. I think that um, you're looking at the team that Arsenal started with. It's more than good enough to win that game. More than good enough. It's a team that you know, last season they played a lot as well. Yeah, I mean, Kai Havertz started in midfield and maybe he's been playing better as the false nine that he's been playing in, in recent weeks and maybe they lost that kind of aspect. But I think it was down to uh, poor individual displays uh, for me. Um, I thought Zaniolo absolutely tore Ben White apart mm. at that time. They, he couldn't deal with the physicality of Zaniolo. I mean, these kind of individual performances, Ben White, Gabriel Zinchenko, I think lost them that game. And I thought uh, Declan Rice as well over the last couple of games gone missing a little bit. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, obviously, Watkins uh, sealed it late on. And, it was, and also another thing uh, that people pointed out in this one, which was quite odd. Um, Arsenal go 1-0 down, what, one, 83rd minute. And you look at the stadium when Watkins scores. It's yeah. empty. Yeah. And it's really strange because you're in a title race. You know you know there's lengthy stoppage times as well. What was it? Seven minutes or whatever, an eight minute stoppage time. You've seen how many times have teams turned it around in stoppage time this season? Two, Particularly even, Arsenal. And Arsenal. And even, even not just one, but score two goals as well in, in stoppage time. So... Do you reckon as well, because it was a very drab ending for Arsenal, do you reckon the players would have looked around and seen, you know, they're supposed to be in a title challenge. Not only are they in a title challenge, they're in great form. And yet they're looking around. There's an empty stadium when they're supposed to be pushing right till the last minute. I thought that was really poor form from Arsenal fans. I think it's embarrassing. It really is embarrassing from Arsenal fans. You're going 1-0 down in one of the biggest games of the season. You've got a chance to go top of the league. The best Arsenal team that you've probably seen in the last 15 years um, since that prime Wenger team uh, that went unbeaten a whole season. This is probably the best Arsenal team since then, right? And they can't even, the fans can't even stick with the uh, players until the end. I think it's embarrassing. It really is. And if you're an Arsenal fan, you've got to hang your head in shame uh, if you were there and you left early because you've got to stick with your team, especially in a moment like that where you can go top of the league. You saw what happened with Liverpool before the game. And by the way, I saw a clip of the Arsenal fans um, in the stadium watching that Liverpool game and they were on top of the world watching that Liverpool game. They go there singing their hearts out and then they don't even stay till the end. It's one goal in it. It's it's embarrassing. Yeah. And I, I understand the argument. Like people say, oh, you know, the fans pay their money. They can do what they want. And that is true. And what they wanted to do was abandon their team in a title challenge, which yeah. is, I think, an indictment of uh, maybe the entitlement that's seeping in maybe back into Arsenal fans because they've had a good r a ride of it. But to, for that kind of reaction, uh, I thought was really, really poor because the team have been in great form. So I don't know how they can turn it's their arrogance. back on them. It's pure arrogance. Um, and I don't understand how a team who haven't won a title since 2005, I think it is, 2004, 2005, 2004, yeah. whenever it is, to be so close to a title, to be so close to challenging at this stage of a season, how they can have so much arrogance it's right ridiculous. about them. It's mad. Uh, oh, turning attention to Villa, though. Unbelievable performance. Yeah. Unbelievable result for them. Massive putting credit them, to Villa. Massive. Putting them right uh, in the f um, in the favourites now after Spurs' result for the top four. Um, what was it? incredible, um, before the game, Opta, before this weekend, sorry, Opta put um, Villa at 35% finishing top four and now they're at 70 percent after one week so it shows how much is flipped um yeah. the chances obviously villa's run in although it's not easy it's kinder than tottenham's who's couldn't get much harder because we play the top three yeah. um although villa's run in i would say they don't have any easy games um because we've also got two of the bottom three still to play as well yeah. so it is i guess all still to play for but after that performance what a shot in the arm that will give villa because it seemed to be um dying a bit like their form and their belief but that kind of result might be the shot on the arm they needed to have a second wind yeah um 100 it's aston villas to lose now but when you're looking at the points it's that we're three points behind and, and we got a game in hand yeah so uh we're three goals behind in terms of the goal difference a massive goal swing this weekend by the way yeah uh, you know they get plus two we get minus four so a six goal swing this weekend which could be the difference um 
But look, it is all to play for. Uh, we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks. Spurs have got an incredibly hard run now uh, where we play Arsenal next. We got Liverpool. Uh, we got Chelsea away in that time as well. So um, we'll see where we're at after the next three games. Um, and uh, Unai, he's, Unai's got form at the Emirates, hasn't he? He does have form he, at the Emirates. Uh, he's, he's got Vill form. Villarreal, uh, I remember to, he stopped them in the semi-finals, And uh, he's come back to haunt, haunt them a couple of times Done now. Done the double over them. Done the double over them. Yeah, absolutely. So fair play to Unai and um, brilliant tactical performance from him. Yeah, um, and... Uh, for the title, yeah. Uh, City, it's the ominous, isn't it? Yeah, and we had this conversation right in the last review of the Prem. I asked you the question, um, what, where do you think rank your one to three? And you said Liverpool at the top, Arsenal mm. second, Man City third. And I had uh, Man City first, Arsenal second and Liverpool third. I mean, surely you've got to agree with me now. I still think Liverpool could finish above Arsenal, actually. Really? Yeah, I do. Um, because I, because look, to be fair to Liverpool, yes, they lost, but they, at least they create a whole load of chances. Villa were actually the better team against Arsenal, but then he, yeah, but Villa were a much better. You can't say Villa are a better team, but but also Arsenal did create chances in the first half. They created a couple. Trossard, apart from that Trossard one, there's not real clear cut. Mm. They had the Saka had one they hit wide that was like a half chance. Yeah, if that goes in, it's a worldie. Yeah. So apart from the Trossard one, was there any real clear cut opportunities? Mm. Like Liverpool created a bucket load, and yeah. they they'll be kicking themselves they didn't win. I mean, look, they had 1.64 xG to Villa's 0.94. Yeah, but that's because they had a lot more shots, probably I would say, than the Villa. Villa were the better team in that second half. Agreed. Um, Completely agree. Um, but they had they had 1.45 xG just in the first half alone. Yeah, a lot because Trossard that was a big one from that. You know, right in the six yard box. But going to your point. Now City have the lead, um, which I know I, w I didn't predict Liverpool to lose to Palace, obviously. Now City have that advantage. You look at their fixtures, you're like, where are they dropping points? And it's yeah. very difficult to see where. Yeah, and um, you're looking at Arsenal. I mean, if Arsenal drop any points in the next three games, they, they play three games now before Man City next play. Yeah. So there is an opportunity. Wolves away, Chelsea at home. Wolves away, Chelsea at home, and there's another one as well. Uh, or but... Bayern in the, cut, in the Champions League. No, I think there's another Premier League Spurs then. It'll be, have to be Spurs then. No, I think there's a different one. I'll, I'll, I'll see in a sec, but they, there's a possibility by the time City next play, Arsenal could be four points clear. If, with what was City having two games in hand? Yeah. So it does put pressure on City a bit. Do they have to win? But they have to that now they've put the pressure on themselves because of that performance and they will see how they react to it and it also will be interesting to see if what happens on against Bayern if they go out in that if they go out against Bayern as well will that affect things we we'll have to wait and see or if they go through maybe it'll give them another confidence boost yeah you I think everyone's got to start calling them April Arsenal now because like two years ago in um in the Champions League running they bottled it in April Last year as well, bottled it in April. And this year as well, it seems like history is repeating itself. We'll have to wait and see. It is only one defeat, but it was a very um, bad, bad performance. But um, it just goes against everything of the, what their form has been showing. Right? Mm. They've, they've looked like unbeatable in these last, since the turn of the it year. Seemed, they have literally looked unbeatable. You haven't been able to create a chance against them. And you, you, when you say like bottle, that was like, it seemed it got to them. It got yeah. to their head, the situation. Mm -hmm. So that's what it looked like to me uh, in that situation. Yeah. All right. Well, let's finish off talking about Chelsea as Chelsea won by six goals to nil against a lackluster Everton side. Sim went for 2-2. I went for 1-1. One, one. And how wrong were we? This was the Cole Palmer show. What a performance from Cole Palmer. Four goals on the day. Um, some brilliant goals in there as well, particularly the second one, I think it was. Well, the first and third one, I think. Oh, the first, yeah. Sorry, the first one and the third one. Um, that lob uh, with his wrong mm. foot. Uh, just unbelievable. Um but let's start talking about Everton first because I thought they were absolutely diabolical. They didn't. They basically just didn't turn up. Yeah, and it was weird because I was listening to the, the Sky Sports commentators and they were like, "Oh, I do, you know, oh, this was a five 0 They're like, "I don't think the alarm bells are, are there yet, but you know, another defeat and they might be." I'm, I'm looking. I'm looking at the table. They're two points clear of the relegation zone. Their only win since December was because Murich kicked it straight at Calvert Lewin and they won one 0 against Burnley at home. That's been their only win yeah. since December. They're getting absolutely battered by a really inconsistent Chelsea team who hasn't battered anyone all season, and they're losing six 0 Can't even lay a glove on them and they're conceding goal after goal after goal in that game they're giving they're gifting goals away for free Pickford's kicking it straight at Palmer they're giving away penalties um, you know Brownfoy's getting nutmegged for that first goal as well uh, they looked all at sea at the back and if you're an Everton team conceding six goals against um, Chelsea 
you know, you're not, you don't pride yourself as a team who goes and gets loads of goals yourself because, you know, you're playing a, a Beto up front who's very inconsistent. You, there's not many, I mean, Decore's goals are dried up. McNeil was not really a goal scorer. Um, Ashley Young is playing a right wing. He's 30 bloody five. Mm. Like, there has to be major red flag, major, major alarm bells. I can't believe I'm listening to Sky Sports. They're saying they're not quite alarm bells yet for Everton. I was like, are you crazy? There's got to be major alarm bells. I think they're in serious danger here of going yeah. down. It's, I think they're in serious danger. I think when you look at Luton and Burnley, I just don't think they've got enough points in them to finish above Everton. I just really don't. And Luton and Forest. Luton and Burnley. Has to be Forest. What Luton, but well, well, they have to finish below Luton and Forest. Burnley are 19th and Luton are 18th. Yeah, and Forest seventeenth. They have to below finish be, uh, between two. If, they, other if, they, three. if Forest finished above Everton, they're not going down. They need to finish below Luton and Burnley. And I'm saying I don't think Luton or Burnley and and Burnley have enough points in them to finish above Everton. I think, I think they do. The way for Everton are going, Everton really can't don't. win. I know, I know that, but neither can Luton or Burnley really. But I'm watching them play. They seem to have a bit more. F I, I know Luton are getting battered, but Burnley are seven points behind Everton. Not Burnley. Forget Burnley. They're gone. I'm looking at Luton and Forest. And Everton. I think it's two. It's between Only one of those three go down. Correct. Right? Correct. I don't know. Luton are also getting battered week in week out at the moment. They are, and, that, and but I don't know. I, I'm looking at them when they play at home, and I seem I'm seeing them create more chance than Everton are, and I'm seeing them play better than Everton. Everton yeah, look you... really short of ideas at the moment. Yeah, I agree with that, and I just feel like Everton are lucky because Luton are worse than them in terms of um, the way they've been all season you're looking at the results that they're getting it's all well and good Luton going out there and creating chances but they're not getting points on the board Luton have to go to uh, Everton have to go to Kenilworth mm, Road as game. well that's, that's a game. massive massive game and if they lose that yeah. I'm saying that's what I'm saying they're still a massive threat of going down here because they could easily go there and lose the way they're playing they look yeah. they lost them at Goodison as well so I think Everton are in serious danger I do feel for Everton a little bit though because without these points deductions they'll be more than safe yeah, well, you add, what, 12 points to their total, I think? No. Uh, six, isn't it? Because it was six, it was then six, it got then reduced to four, four, then plus two. Yeah, yeah, so six points, yeah. And that would be, yeah, they'll put them on 33. They'll put them level with Palace. So they'll be they'll be safe. I wouldn't say it'll be a great season, but they'll definitely be safe. Um, but, yeah, so I do feel for them a bit. But at the end of the day, they have won in only one game since December. And as I said, that was a really dodgy 1-0 one, one win against Burnley as well in that. So they could have easily not even won that game. How many game. games has Luton won since December? I don't Probably know. Not. I don't know. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't looked at that. But they, you know, they beat, uh, they had a really good win against Bournemouth the other week, turning it around with good performance. Like, when they win, at least they look a bit more convincing. Everton, Who I don't had know. had a good win against? Didn't, didn't Bournemouth beat Luton 4-3? Yeah, and they beat them in oh, the, next the next game. 2-1. So, pff, I think, I think, look, I agree with you. But Everton aren't, uh, are better than Luton. I just think that um, it's still all to play for. And Luton, I, I, actually, I still think Luton are playing better than Everton, to be honest, like mm -hmm. on the, the football they play. I think they play better football. So I think Luton, in a weird way, are more likely to win games, even though they're both, both teams are getting battered at the moment. Yeah, I just look at both of them, and I don't think either of them are likely to win uh, too many games. Um, you're looking at Luton's fixtures... They don't have any of the top teams left to play. They do Brentford at home, who are not exactly picking up a lot of points at the moment. Wolves away, uh, which is obviously a difficult game. Everton at home, West Ham away and Fulham at home. I do think it's all going to come down to that one game, Luton against Everton. If Luton can beat Everton, what a massive, massive game. It is Road as well. Yeah, that could, that could be an absolute massive game. So definitely Everton. And also Everton play Forest this weekend. So massive games coming up for yeah. Everton. Yeah. I mean, if, and then they got Liverpool, and they so does it like they they they're very much in it, very much in it, in my opinion. I think alarm bell should definitely be ringing for them. Who's your prediction to go down then? You're going Everton. <sighs> no, I still think it'll be Luton. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but I'm just saying, I think it's a lot like. I don't. I don't look at the situation thinking, oh, they should be all right. I'm thinking they should be panicking right now, yeah. in my opinion. But in terms of Chelsea, um, brilliant performance on um, on the face of things. I thought Nicholas Jackson's got a brilliant goal. I as thought well. he was brilliant all game. Um, yeah, he was uh, golden assist. I think it was for Nick Jackson. Mm. Uh, but we got to talk about that embarrassing moment. That penalty. Poch looks so angry about that after the game. Palmer uh, tried to play it down a bit with Gilchrist in the um, thing after the game, but. 
from both of them, from Madueke and um, from Nick Jackson. Such embarrassing scenes. You're falling up and you're fighting and scrapping like that for a penalty when it's clear all season that Cole Palmer is the penalty taker. And Deli Ali made such a great point in the um, in the comms after the game. He's like, well, no one was fighting for the penalty at the last minute against Manchester United to go 4-3 up. And now because it's 4-0 and there's no pressure in it, you're all fighting over a penalty. Mm. It was embarrassing. It was embarrassing. They were, abs- they were like kids in the school ground, trying both of them to go running grab the ball fighting the ball with each other and then getting all pissed off because they you know palmer's pen is taken he's the one who should be taking it and also just a stat pad as well just to get your goal and assist numbers up it's not because you think i'm the best person to take this penalty because i think we need to take the lead here it's like i just want a goal to get my goals and assists. it was four nil and it was four nil up it's just embarrassing it was an absolute embarrassment and the funniest uh, thing was when um when uh, Gallagher takes the ball off Madueke and gives it to uh, Cole, right? And then Jackson comes back. Yeah, he's like, what? <laughs> you, you, you've already given up and now you're trying to go for afters. I, I don't know what you guys are playing at, to be honest. Um, but look, credit to Chelsea. Big, um, um, obviously, big win. They're now eight unbeaten, to be fair. Although yeah. they had some poor results against Sheffield United and Burnley. They are eight, eight unbeaten, so they deserve, deserve some sort of credit for that. And they're only th- uh, three points off top six of the game in hand, uh, albeit that is Spurs but um, they have a game in hand. So, you know, if Poch can get in the top six, they've got an FA Cup fi- um, semi-final on the weekend. You know, their season is still all to play for all think, of a sudden. Do you think Chelsea fans would have taken that before the game, uh, finishing sixth, FA Cup, uh, let's say final and you don't know what happens and a League Cup final loss uh, to Liverpool? Well, we won't say the kids. Um, would that have been a good season, judging on what Chelsea did last season? Probably. I would say so. So, I think that would have been progression. So yeah. is Poch getting um, a bit of a bad rap then? Well, they are still ninth, so yeah. it depends where they finish. But if they were to get in that top six, and, you know, depends what happens. Uh, forget what happens against City, because, you know, they're probably going to go out. But, you know, semi-final well, in the well Cup. against City in the league this season. True. They might, they might go through. Semi-final, or maybe even a final of the FA Cup, final of the League Cup. Top, if they get into the top six, I think that's a good season for them. And Poch will definitely, all of a sudden, be, things will be looking very different for him. Two losses only uh, since the turn of the year for Chelsea. And when you think about the narrative around Chelsea and how everyone's, they've been like a, fan, a factor of fun uh, to laugh at this season. I mean, they're not losing that many games, are they? I, I, look, I look at them compared to Manchester United. And I look at Chelsea as a much mm. better team than Man United. Definitely much more well coached, um, for sure. They look they they're uh, when they're in games. I think they look a lot better than Man United do. And as you say, I think since the turn of the year, only the top three have more points than them. Mm. So I think he's probably doing something right. Yeah, and in those last five games, though, they did draw with Sheffield United and Burnley, yeah. which makes that Everton result look even worse. It wasn't just uh, the draws; it was there. performances in those games. Yeah, were terrible. it's true, um, but. If they did get those points on the board, they'd be fighting top four. Yeah, which is crazy to think about. Which is mad. But uh, look, let's just finish off talking about Cole Palmer. Level goals with Erling Haaland this season. Um, what an unbelievable purchase and pickup he's been with Man City. First of all, do you think Man City regretting letting him go? And second of all, does he sh- have a shout for player of the year this season? Both On both counts, I would say, yeah, for sure. I think Man, I, I mean, are Man City regretting letting him go? They could win another treble. I mean, you're not going to regret letting someone go when you want, when you win the, win the treble. So. He's a guy that's come through the academy. and True, you know, and showing. that's got to be a massive... Uh, and also, he had such a good start to the season for them. He scored in the Community Shield a great goal, didn't he? Yeah. And um, maybe at that point, they should have said... Um, uh, you're going to be our number one winger this year, but maybe they didn't quite want to give him, give him those guarantees. Um, but it was the sound like Palmer said either send me on loan or sell me, I think he said, didn't he? Um, yeah. Or oh, sorry, send me on loan. No, Palmer said send me on loan, loan. And, and they Man said, City said, said I'm no. not, we're only selling you or keeping you. We're not yeah, we're not you sending you on. That was it. Um, so they, are, they probably are regretting it because they sold him 47 million. His, his value's probably tripled now uh, and then some. For him to be level on points with Haaland is astonishing achievement in his first season, especially for such a poor, you know, inconsistent Chelsea team. You know, people putting comparisons to other attackers. What other attackers would be in this Chelsea team and putting those kind of numbers up? No one. It's yeah, incredible. No one. It's incredible. I do liken it a bit to what Poch did with Deli Alley um, in the early Spurs days. You know, he was getting 18 goals in a season. I think it was was his best numbers. And um, I see that I see a few similarities in Deli Alley and Cole Palmer. 
yeah um the way they play just their freedom they get um the confidence that poch gives them as well he's having an astonishing season obviously he's more than booked himself in that playing for the euros he should be starting to be honest in the form he's in um he seems unstoppable at the moment that's what consecutive home hat tricks as well for him now um I think he scored eight goals or something in his last three or four games it's madness it's absolute madness what he's doing and the quality of the goals that first goal yeah. that quality nutmeg one two with jackson then curled it outside the box into the bottom corner unbelievable then that third goal right foot first um gets it off from 40 yards and if you see the finish it's not easy it curls it outside the post and yeah. in back in, into the goal i mean the quality in this player is astonishing and i think not even the most optimistic of chelsea fans could have imagined what a season he's having so player of the year i think it's hard to look past him the young player and player he should be i remember when bale won both i don't see why he can't win both because he could be top goal scorer and top assister mm. So why it's not? It's true, but also you got to look at Ollie Watkins as well. You have to with if if Villa as well finish in the top four, he would have been central to it. He also could finish off on Golden Boot this year. He's only one goal behind. True. The amount of assists he's getting as well. So, but Watkins is doing it from a striker's position. It's harder to do maybe from where Palmer it is. To no, of course I don't disagree, but I think like you got to recognise what Watkins has done this season. If he finishes top goal scorer, Villa get into the top four. For me, I would put Watkins as player of the year and Cole Palmer young player of the year because I think both have to be recognised. Mm, fair play. That's not a bad opinion. Um, but let's finish off talking about our star men. Man City won five goals to one, but Kevin De Bruyne did absolutely nothing. So I had Salah against Sheffield United <laughs> and De Bruyne against Luton, both getting zero. <laughs> and I had uh, Nottingham Forest, who did score two goals on the day, but Chris Wood had nothing to do with either of the goals as well. So uh, zero points for uh, both our star men. But I did cut the gap a little bit uh, down to nine points this week. 307, 11 sorry, 11 points this week. 377 to 300. And 68 in Sims' favour. We'll see what happens this weekend. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you all very soon.